have I have some exciting things for you today. What's the name of the Torah portion today? Vaishlak. <clears throat> shalak. The word shalak. What does that mean in English? Just the word shalak? Sent. Sent. That's why the apostles were called shaliak. A shaliak is someone who is sent. So the Hebrew word for uh, apostle basically is a shaliak. Even to this day, the Jews often send shaliaks to America to speak at colleges and different things like that, and they're called shaliak, and it means sent. So the vav at the beginning that has the underline is and, and he sent. So they'll have like three English words and one Hebrew word. But whenever you see the letter vav to, at the beginning of a word, it always means and, and this, and it's the connecting. It's connecting to the word before it. Now, we know this story here. We have Jacob. He's wrestled with the angel, and now he's about to encounter his brother Esau. I mean, did any of you know any twins in your family? Did the twins get along or do they fight? They always seem to get along. And that's what's so amazing about this whole story is Jacob and Esau can't stand each other. <clears throat> now, who was Esau's grandson? Amalek. Amalek. And he's the one that literally wanted to kill all of Jacob's kids. And now Jacob is scared. He's coming into the promised land, and he knows he's going to have to confront Esau. But we know that God told him it's, it's all going to be good, but oftentimes we don't listen. And so he sends messengers to Esau. Well, the thing is, the same word that means messengers in Hebrew can also mean angels. So did he send angels, or did he send People? Well, let's look at the story. Oh, first off, how many have ever heard do unto others and you would have them do unto you? Where does that come from? It's in the Bible. It's in our Haftorah portion, Obadiah. Obadiah is a very short book, but it's all about Esau's hatred for Jacob, which is why it is the Haftorah portion. And you're going to find that verse in just a minute. I want to start with Obadiah. Let's go to chapter 1, verse 10 through 12. It says, because of the violence. It's one thing to, you know, shove your brother against a wall. It's another thing to chop his head off. And so this has violence. This is not good. He says, because of your violence against your twin, shame will cover you, and you're going to be cut off forever. And look what they did. This is when Nebuchadnezzar is killing everybody that's trying to leave Jerusalem. That's what this is about. And look what Esau did. You stood on the other side in the day that strangers carried away captive his forces. Foreigners entered into his gates. They cast lots on Jerusalem, and you were just as one of them. Their heart was so thrilled that Judah was being destroyed. God knows the heart. And he says, you should not have looked on the day that your brother, in the day that he became a stranger, neither should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. So what does this tell us about God? Whenever you read these things, you, if God deemed it important enough to write it for us, we have to read it with the intent, God, what are you trying to tell us? Basically, don't rejoice over your enemy's downfall. I mean, all too often, it, be it political downfall or be it an economic downfall or a war downfall, uh, you know, when the wicked die, uh, you know, uh, do we rejoice or do we not rejoice? God just wants us... I mean, uh, in one, at one time, God will okay it <laughs> at the very end. But basically, we need to realize as bad as they were, they were created in God's image. 
And God created them on purpose, for a purpose, and they didn't fulfill that purpose. So we can't always rejoice when bad things happen to the people we don't like. But look at this. This is the worst in verse 14 and 15. Neither should you have stood in the crossway to cut off those that were trying to escape. Neither should you have delivered up those of his that remained in the day of distress. So what is happening? They're trying to flee, and his twin, Esau's kids, would grab them while they're trying to escape and turn them over to the Babylonians. Now that is taking a very active approach in destroying your brother. You know, oftentimes you see parents covering for their kids when they did some evil thing, you know, which isn't always good. They probably should turn them in. But at the same time, here Esau is trying to stop all of the tribe of Judah from escaping when they're about to be killed. And they turn them over to be killed. I don't know if you knew this. How many ever heard of the ship, the St. Louis, in history? During Germany's, the World War II, the Jews were fleeing from Germany. There was a whole big boat from the United States called the St. Louis, and it had a boatload of Jews. And they came to the eastern coast of the United States, and the United States refused to have them relocate here. They ended up going back to Germany and ended up being killed. Now, we call Israel our brother and sisters, but at the same time, Look what, this is one of the things that the United States did that is horrific in history. They literally, look up, look it up, look it up. A whole boatload of Jews trying to flee Germany was sent back by the United States. That's our State Department for you. Okay, <clears throat> now look at uh, 14 and 15. It goes on to say, the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As you have done, it shall be done to you. There it is. As you have done, so will it be done to you. And so this is the principle in the Bible called measure for measure. The same measure that you meted out will be meted upon you. Okay, so guess what? The Holocaust was a, a genuine time of tribulation for the Jewish people where the nations totally forsook them. And so that's the seven-year tribulation. God is going to pay back the Gentiles with the tribulation. It's measure for measure. You know, all, the, all of the oppression that the world has put upon the Jews over the last 3,500 years will be compressed for the Gentiles in seven years. That's something to be thinking about. That's why we don't want to be a goat nation. We want to be a sheep nation. And so it says, now I just want to remind you of everything. He's leaving Laban, all right? He's wrestled with, was it a man or an angel or God who uh, then he has to confront Esau. So it's a good thing he wrestled with God first before he wrestled with Esau. And then he goes off to Shechem. But if you remember, when he left, he made a promise that he would go to Jerusalem, right? But he delayed fulfilling his vow. He went to Shechem instead, and therefore, all the calamity happened at Shechem. He should have gone to Jerusalem first. And it's important. Uh, this is when Dinah, she's only 10 years old, gets raped by Shechem. Uh, then he stops at the Temple Mount, and Rachel dies there in Bethlehem and never gets to meet Isaac. Isaac lives in Hebron, and so as they're coming down, Rachel dies before Jacob meets up with Isaac, who's still alive. And so here's our verse where it begins, the Torah portion, in Genesis 32, 3. Jacob sent messengers, but like I said, that could mean angels, uh, before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. That's Esau is Edom. That's his territory. And then guess what? The messengers came back and returned to Jacob. And he said, guess what? We came to your brother Esau. He wants to come and meet you with 400 soldiers. <laughs> and I was like, uh-oh. Now what am I going to do? I have Now, remember, how old are Jacob's kids? Uh, Reuben is the oldest, and he's like 13, and everyone else is younger. 
And so it's like, good grief, I've got, you know, all these kids and these four wives and I'm about to be attacked by 400 armed soldiers. And it's like, uh uh-oh. So look at the next verse. It says, Jacob was greatly afraid. Not just afraid, he's greatly afraid. He's distressed. And he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two bands. All right, so if one gets attacked, the other one can't escape. They'll know what the intent is. But here's the thing that I want to point out. Jacob operated out of fear. That's what he was doing. He did that out of fear and allows fear to control his response. He never asked God, what should I do? So this is a lesson for us today. Don't be consumed with fear when something is happening. Stop and ask God, what am I supposed to do? God will talk to you. I guarantee it. Like at the time I had a gun at my head. I had fear. (laughs) Okay. Uh, I didn't know what he was going to do. I don't know if he was drunk, if he was on drugs, if he was a professional. But God literally spoke to me audibly. Uh, No, it wasn't audibly. It was internally that time. Uh, but it's, it's like that really comforts you when God speaks to you and tells you what to do. Okay. Now, if you also remember when he had fled from his brother Esau, God had promised him then that he would return safely to Canaan. He should have relied on God's promises. But all too often when it comes to like the spies, the 10 spies that had the bad report, they're afraid of the giants, but Jacob and Esau weren't afraid. Perspective. It's always perspective, and the biggest perspective is, do we trust in God or not? You know, that's why, uh, you know, it may be crazy, but like I said before, I've almost died so many times, I've lost count. I mean, guns in my head twice and all kinds of things that I really believe if it's not my time, it's not going to happen. And if it is my time, there's nothing I can do about it, you know, uh, and I need a new body anyway. <laughs> but at the, at the same time, it's, it's like... I will never act out of fear. I will always take a moment, if I have a moment, to analyze what I should do, ask God what I should do. How many have ever seen anyone respond irrationally, emotionally in a situation there was no reason for it? It happens. Okay. And uh, so 20 years have gone by. From the time that Jacob fled, 20, you would think after 20 years they might get over it. Okay. Okay. Well, let's see what happens. We see in Genesis 31, 41, this is when Jacob says, these 20 years I've been in your house. He's referring to Laban's house. So we see 20 years have gone by. And then in Genesis 32, 22 through 25, it says he rose up that night and took his what? Okay, so two were wives and two were women servants or concubines. And his 11 sons, because Benjamin wasn't born yet, And there was also Dinah, who isn't mentioned here. And they passed over the Ford Jabbok, and he took them and sent them over the brook, sent over all that he had, and Jacob was left alone. And there it says he wrestled what? He wrestled a man until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he didn't prevail against him, he touched the hall. This he is the angel or man. Touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Now, how old was Jacob when he was wrestling the angel? 97. 97 years old. Well, what's fascinating is 200 years later, when Moses is writing the Torah, it brings up this situation. Look at this. If a man have how many wives? (laughs) <laughs> one beloved and one hated. Well, that sounds like Leah and Rachel. And they born him children, both the beloved and the hated. If the firstborn son be hers that was hated, it shall be when he makes his sons to inherit that which he has, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. So God is settling this situation right now, putting it in writing. Now, look at this. Here, we just got done reading. It was a man he wrestled with. Well, let's go to Hosea 12, 2 through 4. 
It says the Lord has a controversy with Judah, and he's going to punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his doings. He will recompense him. He took his brother Esau by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with who? God. Yes, he wept and cried to him, and he had power over the angel. Well, that is the same Hebrew word as messenger, and he overcame. So he is wrestling is it with a man? Is it with an angel? Is it with God? Well, I think that's quite fascinating that it seems like it's all three. It could have been Yeshua himself, who is both man and God and the messenger of the Lord of hosts, like he said when he appeared to Joshua. Let's go to Genesis 32, 26, and 30. I think it's interesting. It says here Jacob is wrestling this angel and the whole time he's wrestling him, he's crying to him. He's weeping and he's crying and he's really saying, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. I think he knew who it was. And it says, uh, Genesis 32, 26 to 30, let me go, the angel is saying, for the day breaks. And he said, I'm not going to let you go except you bless me. Can you imagine you're wrestling with someone over a blessing? I mean, usually... You think you're wrestling with someone in a big fight who wants to beat the bejeebies out of you. But here, Jacob knows he's wrestling with God, the angel, because he's crying no time. Can you imagine you're in a fight and you're, you know, this guy's punching you and you're say, wrestling with him. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. <laughs> I mean, strange situation here. And so uh, then it gets, uh, then it uh, he said to him, the angel says to Jacob, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, have you what? Power with God. Wow, isn't that interesting? Here we just read in Hosea, he had power over the angel. And now it says, you've had power with God and with men. And that prevailed. And so Jacob asked him, well, tell me, I pray you, what is your name? What a way to end a fight. And he said, why is it you're asking after my name? And then he blessed him right there. And Jacob called the name of the place, what? Peniel. El is God and Panay is face. So he named it Peniel. And because he says, I've seen God face to face. This is amazing. My life is preserved. Sometimes uh, we have to wrestle with God to preserve our life. Yeah, an encounter with God is always special. And I also often wonder too, you know, why another blessing? Was the blessing from Isaac not good enough? Isaac blessed him and sent him away and he came back. All these wonderful blessings. But now here he gets another blessing. Oh. Why is this blessing important? First off, who has the authority to name you? Well, uh, your parents. The next door neighbors don't name you. Well, you know what's fascinating? As we were talking earlier, Bilha and Zilpa each had a couple of kids, but who named them? Leah and Rachel named they're like they were surrogate mothers almost. I don't know if you ever thought about that. They were the women's servants. And so they were like surrogate mothers because Rachel and Leah are the ones who got to name them. But naming someone means uh, you're my kid. Even if your kid is adopted, okay, they get your name. And so even as the Gentiles are grafted in, the fact that we get a name from God may, means he is taking authority over our lives. We just have to volunteer that. And so look what it says in Revelation 3.12. Him that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. He'll go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Wow. We get three names. Isn't this amazing? Look at Revelation 2, 17. Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, 
I will give to eat of the hidden manna. I will give them a white stone. And in that stone, a new name written, which no one knows except the one who gets it. Wow. I don't know how many of you, your parents gave you nicknames. You know, uh, ours did. Mine was Mickey Mouse. Because uh, when my dad was in the hospital and I'm like two years old, I had a Mickey Mouse hat on when I went and visited him. Uh, but uh, this is amazing. Look at all the new names you're going to get. And when someone asks you, what is your name? Well, which name do you want me to give you? I got four. Okay. You know, Israel basically means to struggle with God. That's what it means, to struggle. And how many of us have ever had to struggle with God? Uh, as long as we're human, you know we're going to encounter that. And I just wanted to show you uh, this slide here. On this slide here, now the 2205 is how long it's been from creation, from Adam. And I have the scripture verses there. Isaac is 157 when Jacob wrestles the angel at 97. And you'll see that Isaac lives a few more years, uh, like 23 more years, or what is that? Oh, no, 11 more years until he... Uh, let's see. Yeah, Isaac dies at 22, 28. So that'd be, uh, he lives 23 more years. And Joseph is six years old when they're crossing uh, the Jordan. Uh, so yeah, Isaac lived from when the time Isaac crossed his hands. Uh, I mean, yeah, Isaac lived another 43 years when, uh, not Isaac, but um, Jacob's the one who crossed his hands. But uh, when Isaac does the blessing, uh, thinking he's going to die. He lives another 43 years. That's a long time. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's go down to Genesis 33, 4. Here, Esau runs to meet him. I'd be kind of scared. I wonder if the, any of the 400 men were running at the same time. And he embraced him, fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. Okay. Esau. Embraces him, kisses his neck. Well, I want to show you something you don't see in the English that is so fun. Okay, who can tell me these letters? What's the one on the left here? What? Tet. And what's that one? Tov. Okay, so here we have the tet and the tov. Now tell me what sound they make. T, that's, whenever you read a Hebrew letter, know the first sound is the sound of that letter, so we have the letter T. But here's the problem. Why in any language would you have two letters that make the same sound? Doesn't that sound like a waste of letters? Or does, I mean, God wastes nothing. So in Hebrew, and I don't know if it's like this in uh, Russian or Ukrainian or in Spanish or, you know, in South Korean, are there any two letters that are identical in sound? No. So this is to make a big importance. I want to say something about this. Why would God, who is perfect, create an alphabet where our several letters make the same sound? I will tell you why. The tet has a numerical value of nine and the ta 400, which means there is great importance in the numerical value of the Hebrew words. Now, I don't know how many of you loved algebra or hated algebra, but the point is letters represent numbers, right? Well, here, the letters represent numbers. This is why Hebrew, you have to understand what's called the gematria or the numerical value because what they say is when two numbers have the same numerical value, they have to be equal in some way. And so you want to look to see what equality there is. Well, here's another letter. Who can tell me what these are? What's the one on the left? Kuf. And what's the other one? Kof. And what sound did they make? K. Okay? So you have the kuf. No, not that kof. A different kof. Kuf and kof. Here there's two Ks. Now the Kuf can have a C-H hard sound like Bach, okay? So it's and K, but they both can sound like K. 
Okay, now watch this. Kuf has 100 and Kof is 20. Why are there two with the same sound? Because they have different numerical value. Here is the Hebrew word where Esau kisses them. Okay, now, these are not vowel points. Vowel points are always basically on the bottom. Look at these little dots that's in every Torah scroll from the beginning. What is the purpose of that? They say they are really teeth marks where Esau bit his neck rather than kissed his neck. Now, let me show you why that is. Now, do you see the kuf? It can be, it's, what sound is the kuf? K. What sound is the cough? K. Well, if you take the shin and the kuf, it means to kiss. Well, do you remember the word bark? What is the definition of bark? What do you mean, the bark of a tree or the bark of a dog? It's the same thing in Hebrew. You can look at this and see kiss, but if you make it the cough, it becomes bite. Their kiss and bite are related phonetically. And the only way you know which is correct with bark is the context of the sentence. Well, they say what's fascinating is the fact that it also sounds like bite. That's why they think his kiss wasn't a nice kiss. It was a kiss on the neck, but it wasn't an I love you kiss. But isn't that fascinating? You only see that in the Hebrew. You see those little teeth marks above the letters. Okay, so what do we see now? In Genesis 33, 18, Jacob came in peace to the city of, the correct way to pronounce it is Shechem, but we say Shechem here in America, but it's Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan when he came from Padan, Aram, and he camped out before the city. So here it is, and uh, right there, right there's the city of Shechem. What are these hilltops called? Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, where all the Levites came and all the tribes came after they uh, entered the land several hundred years later, and they shouted out the curses and the blessings. So that's where it is. And this looks like a view up from like Elon Moray or up there in Itamar uh, where you can see it. It's quite phenomenal. And then what do we see here? It says for 400 or for a hundred bits of money, Jacob got from uh, the children of Hamor. He, Hamor is the one who built the city, the field in which he had put up his tents. And there he put up an altar naming it El, the God of Israel. And then look at Genesis 36 two. Here Esau took his wives of the daughter of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholibama, wow, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion, the what? Hivite. Now I want you to catch this. The Shechemites were Hivites. The Shechemites were called Shechemites because they lived in Shechem, but they were called Hivites because that's who they descended from. You following me? Remember the Hivites. Okay, let's see. Now, we found out the builder of Shechem was what? Who? Hamor. Hamor. Uh, do you know what Hamor means? I gave you a hint. A donkey. Yes. Okay, now the city of Shechem was named after his son. And guess what? Shechem was known as the son of jackass <laughs> or the son of the donkey. That's, that's, hey, I'm the son of the donkey. Okay. Now it says in Genesis 34, one and two. Now Dinah or Dina, the daughter whom Leah had by Jacob went out to see the women of the country and Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, who was the chief of that land, saw her and took her by force and had connection with her. Now, 34, 5. Now Jacob had word of what Shechem had done to who? Okay, I want you to remember that because there's a play on words here. 
had done to his daughter, but his sons were in the fields with the cattle. And Jacob, of course, didn't say anything until they came. And then verse 11, Shechem said to her father and her brothers, if you will give ear to my request, whatever you say, I will give to you. However great you make the bride price and payment, I will give it. Only let me have Dinah for my wife. But the sons of Jacob gave a false answer to Shechem and Amor's father because of what had been done to Dinah, their sister. And they said, it's not possible for us to give our sister to one who is not circumcised, for that would be a cause of great shame to us. But on this condition only will we come to an agreement with you if every male among you becomes like us and undergoes circumcision. And then it says, then we will give our daughters to you and take your daughters to us and go on living with you as one people. Okay, now I don't know if you ever really stopped and pondered what's going on here. You know, it's, he doesn't want money. He doesn't want one dime, okay? There's no mention of money here. The, the boys don't want money, you know? Uh, they want to vengeance, okay? And... The other thing is this, who do these two think they are that they can speak for the men of the town saying all the men get to get circumcised? If I was one of those men, I might question that at the time. Okay, so let's go into Genesis 34, 18 through 22. Now, Shechem, as we know, is horrible for what he did, but get a load of this. Their words were pleasing to Hamor and his son Shechem, and without loss of time, the young man did as they said because he had delight in Jacob's daughter, and he is the noblest of his father's house. This is the most noblest guy? What does that tell you about the rest of the guys that live in the city? And Hamor and Shechem, his son, went to the meeting place of their town and said to the men of the town, good news, we're going to circumcise all of you. <laughs> and it says, uh, it is the desire of these Jews to be at peace with us. Let them then go on living in this country and doing trade here for the country's wide open before them. Let us take their daughters as wives and let us give them our daughters. I'm going to stop there for a minute. They didn't have any daughters other than Dinah. And she's already been taken. Okay. But I guess they're thinking of future, but none of them were married. And so they definitely could take advantage of giving their daughters, is what he said. Let's get, give them their daughters. Do you see that? Now, this is going to be important principle here in a minute, that that's what they wanted to do. And it says, but only herein will they make consent for us to dwell with us, to be one people, if every male among us be circumcised as just like they are. Okay, so I'm sure all the men are contemplating if it is worth... <laughs> If it is worth it. <clears throat> and, but look what Hamor and Shechem add that the sons of Jacob never said. They go, hey, then their cattle and their goods and all their beasts will be ours. So let us come in agreement with them so that may go, they may go on living with us. So they're thinking we're stronger. Sure, let's do it. And then we'll take everything that they own and produce. They'll be our slaves. So they don't have a good motive themselves. And they all agree. It was only then that all the men of the town gave ear to the words of Hamor. Genesis 34, 24, and 25. They, were, they didn't like the circumcision idea. But when they thought it might be worth it because we'll get all of their stuff, great. So every man in the town underwent circumcision and it came to pass on the third day. Now, that's when you're really hurting the most, which is the same third day when Abraham had been circumcised that the two angels appeared to him about destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. But look at this. They all went under, uh, went circumcision, they're sore, and then the two sons of Jacob, and who are they? Simeon and Levi. Now, who's the oldest? Reuben. Okay. And then the next two are Simeon and Levi. Dinah's brothers took each man his sword, came upon the city boldly, and slew all the males. Now, this is going to come a shock, what I'm about to read to most of you. Look at Deuteronomy again, chapter 21, 10 through 13. When you go to war against your enemies, that's what Simeon and Levi just did. 
And the Lord your God has delivered them into your hands, which is what God just did. And you've taken them captive, which is what they did. And you see among the captives a beautiful woman and have a desire unto her that you would have her to be your wife. Then you will bring her home to your house. She has to shave her head, pare her nails. She has to put the raiment of her captivity from off of her and remain in the house and bewail her father and her mother for a full month. And after that, you shall go in unto her and be your husband and she shall be your wife. Okay, well, look what happens in Genesis 34, 29. It says concerning the Shechemites, all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives, they took captive and spoiled even all that was in their house. I'm telling you right now, those sons married the Hivites. Hamor said, you can have our daughters for wives. Okay, now they had a whole lot more than uh, 11 wives, and Joseph is too young anyway. But I'm telling you, I would not be surprised if Reuben, Simeon, Levi all took wives of the Hivites, which goes back again to the Jewishness of the child from the mother. But let's look at Genesis 34, 31. Now Jacob is upset, and he says to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me to make me stink unto the inhabitants of the land, even to the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And look, we're few in number. They're going to gather themselves together against me and smite me, and shall I be destroyed, I and my house? But what does Simeon and Levi say? Well, should one deal with our sister as with the harlot? They didn't say your daughter. So you remember, uh, Jacob says his daughter. But they're thinking, you're by not wanting to do this, well, she may not be your daughter in our minds, but she's our sister, and we're going to do something about it. And so in Genesis 35, 1, God says to Jacob, Arise and go back to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar to God, the one that appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother, the one that you said you'd come back if you hadn't gone to Shechem, but you'd gone directly back to fulfill your vow. It may not have been so bad. And then in Genesis 32, uh, 35, 2 through 5, Jacob says to his household and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you. Why did he say that? They just took all of the strange idols from Shechem. They loaded up with all of their gods and everything else. And be clean and change your garments. I, I always talks about changing your garments after these kind of a things. And this goes back to the parable in the Gospels of someone who didn't change their garments and they went to the wedding and they had on strange apparel. Okay, this means, hey, new garments is, you need to be righteous, okay? And it says, um, uh, arise, let's go up to Bethel. I will make there an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And so look at this. They gave to Jacob all the strange gods which are in their hands and all their earrings which are in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. It talks about the Oaks of Moray that Abraham went to. This is the same place where Abraham had built an altar. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was on the cities that were around about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. Tell you what, if I was one of the other nations too, I'd be terrified after what they did, killing them all. Okay, but here's the thing. Rachel stole some gods from her dad, Laban. Did she turn them over? Everyone, it says, turned them over, but I question whether Rachel did because it's immediately after that she died. What do we see in Genesis 35, 10, and 12? Again, God tells him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called anymore Jacob, but Israel will be your name, and he called his name Israel. But what's fascinating, all through the Tanakh, it bounces back and forth. Jacob said, or Israel said. It's, they go back and forth. Some say Whenever it's Jacob, he's operating in the flesh. Whenever he says Israel, he's operating in the spirit. And if you kind of look at that, it seems to be that way. And then God said to Jacob, I am El Shaddai. I'm God Almighty. Be fruitful, multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of you. Kings will come out of your loins and the land, which I gave Abraham and Isaac. I'm going to give it to you and to your seed. After you will I give the land. Well, see, they never had the land. Even Jacob never got the land. He ends up dying in Egypt. No one has the land. It wasn't until... Later, which you have to realize, sometimes we hear God promises something, we think we're going to get it, but maybe it's for our kids, or maybe it's at, later on in your life. And so we see in Genesis uh, 
35, 16 through 18, they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way, and they came to Ephrat. Ephrat is Bethlehem. Rachel travails, he had hard labor, and it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, fear not, you will have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was departing because she died. She called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Ben-Yamin. What is the difference? She called him Ben-Oni, which means you are the son of my trouble. You are the son of my sorrow. But Jacob called him Ben-Yamin, which means son of my right hand. Well, I believe this is the two comings of Messiah. Son of my trouble is his first coming, and son of my right hand is at his second coming. And then we see in Genesis 35, 19 through 21, Rachel dies. She was buried in the way to Ephrat, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. And Israel journey spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. Okay, well, what's fascinating is Rachel in Hebrew means lamb. So she was a shepherdess of lambs, and that's what her name was. So think about this for a minute. In Bethlehem, Jacob is mourning the death of his precious lamb, Rachel, in Bethlehem. And he pitches his tent at the watchtower for the flocks where another precious lamb will be born that will comfort Jacob or Israel. And then look at this, Genesis 35, 22, it came to pass. While Israel dwelt in this land, okay, his wife, Rachel, dies. Well, look at this. Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and heard of it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. Okay, take a look at this chart here real quick. Okay, so here we go. And <clears throat> Reuben is only 17 years old when he defiles Bilhah. Okay, and this is how old the other kids were, as you can see. And Benjamin is born. Rachel dies. Bilhah is Rachel's handmaid. So now that Rachel is dead, Bilhah is no longer a concubine, but becomes Jacob's wife. And Reuben knows how Leah was hated. So Reuben says, I'm going to go and defile her so that you have to stay with Leah. All right, you're following the logic here. Okay, so uh, what happens, it says, uh, Genesis 35, 29, Isaac gives up the ghost and dies and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob both bury him. But you know what? Joseph has been missing 12 years now. Isaac was suffering from the sale of Joseph as well, not knowing what happened, but he suffered for 12 years. And then we find in Genesis 37, 2, the big change takes place. I don't know if you knew it, but Leah has died. And I have proof that Leah has died. When we see, it says, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, being still a lad, even with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. So now they no longer are concubines or servants. They're actually wives. And... Um, Exodus 1, 7, I just want to bring this point out. The children of Israel were fruitful, increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Even though they are in exile, they're very fruitful. They're multiplying. They're growing like crazy, just like Isaac in a time of famine had increases of hundreds fold. So sometimes you have to realize that when we're in our dark place, even like Joseph in the dungeon, you have to be positive and look at God to find out what is he wanting to accomplish through the situation you're going through. Instead of always being, woe is me, think, God, what are you trying to teach me? Let's at least make, get something positive out of this situation that I'm in. But get a load of this. Uh, here, let me go here first. Okay, Isaac dies, and he dies in uh, the year 2228. He's 180 years old when he dies. Jacob is 120. Joseph is 29 years old at this time in prison. And then the next year, Joseph is 30. He's released from prison. Jacob is 121 when the seven years of prosperity begins. And he's released from prison on Rosh Hashanah. That's what you have to realize. This happened on Rosh Hashanah, which is a type of the resurrection. Okay, 
now, finally, get a load of this. Look at Exodus 38, 26, after they've left Egypt, after 215 years, it says, a becca for every man, which is half a shekel, after the shekel of sanctuary, for everyone that went to be numbered from 20 years old and upward. Okay, so these are only men, 20 years old and upward, and it says 603,550 men. Okay, think of this. The men are 603,000. Well, there's two things I want to point out. Uh, this is at the beginning when they've entered into the wilderness for 40 years. So they went from 70 people, from 70 people when they entered to 603,000 males. If they all got wives, you got to add another 603,000. If they got sons and daughters, I mean, they were a couple of million people that left. A couple of million people. But here's the other thing I want to point out. Reuben had 46,500 when they entered, and Reuben lost 3,000. He only had 43,730 after 40 years. Simeon, who had 59,300 when they entered, when you go to the book of Numbers at the end, they dropped from 59,000 to 22,200. Well, Simeon is the one, that tribe that God wiped out uh, because of uh, Zimri. And then... Uh, Gad, who had 45,650, dropped down to only 40,500. Uh, but anyway, just I think those particular ones are kind of interesting uh, when you see that. And I mentioned Reuben, Simeon, Gad because they are the southern tribes that we'll be looking at after break. All right, let's stand. Sorry, I went a little bit over. Please forgive me. Okay. Let's pray. But what, let's extend the break, though, Jill. Let's not cut the break short. Okay. Avinu Mokenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much for your Torah, for your word. Father, we need to learn to listen to history. We don't want to repeat the same mistakes. Father, the one thing we learn from history is we don't learn from history. And so, Father, we love studying your word because your word is forever and we want to get to know you more. We want to follow you. We want to not only be your sons and daughters, we want to be your friend. And we just thank you for all of those who also just want to be your friend. Father, I thank you for all those who want to magnify your Torah and make it honorable once again. We thank you for all of those who donate to your ministry. This isn't mine. This isn't ours. This is yours. And we're just so thankful that we can be employed by you. We're working for you. We're working to expand your kingdom. And so we're so grateful for all of those that are here locally around the United States and around the world who so faithfully support magnifying the Torah, making it honorable once again in Yeshua's name. Amen. Before we go, I have another announcement that I forgot to make. And that is, this is the end of the year in a couple of weeks, and we want to give everybody their tithe records so they can deduct it for their taxes. So if you have a different mailing address, last year we had a whole bunch of tithing records sent back to us because we didn't have your correct address. So make sure you let the office know so we can make sure that we have the correct address where we mail it to you. Thank you so much. Well... What is the last month of the civil calendar? Of, on the Bible calendar. Okay, what's the first month? That's the first month of the religious calendar, correct. Now, what's the first month of the civil calendar? Tishri. And what is the month before Tishri? Elul. Exactly. Uh, and so when you look at it from the civil calendar, see, Adam was created on Rosh Hashanah. All right. So Elul is the last month. And so it signifies the end, just like for us, New Year's Day signifies the end of one year going into the next year. So the last day of Elul also signifies the end. And as we know, God always saves the best for last. That's why you're here. But let me show you in the Bible, and you can write this down to prove it to anyone who doubts it. This is Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 1. Now you see I have in the Hebrew, then the translation, uh, the transliteration. But here is in the English. It says, in the 
25th year of our exile in the beginning of the year. Now, a lot of people, I don't know if they're anti-Semitic or clueless or what, but they think that the civil calendar is done away with, that Nissan 1 replaced the calendar. No, it didn't. There's actually four calendars. Just like we have a school calendar, we have a fiscal calendar, we got the regular calendar. So this is why I think Christianity believes in replacing Israel. They, they don't realize that you can be added to something. But here it says it is the beginning of the year. Now, everyone would think, well, that's Nisan 1. No, because it says Rosh Hashanah. And here it is, the bait is in, like in the beginning, Rosh Hashanah. So yes, Rosh Hashanah is in the Bible. Rosh Hashanah is still the beginning of the year because Ezekiel is a thousand years after Moses. So yes, they have more than one calendar. So Nisan is the beginning of the religious calendar. Rosh Hashanah, at the beginning of the year, they're talking about the civil year. So put your thinking caps on. Okay, so when you're reading this and it says, in the 25th year of our exile, beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, what is that? What is the 10th day of the month? Yom Kippur. And again, this is telling you, this is the civil calendar. Rosh Hashanah, it's now Yom Kippur, and it's the 14th year after the city has fallen, and on that very day, the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me there. Okay, Ezekiel's in Babylon. He's not in Jerusalem. Okay, the temple's destroyed, but God still recognizes the dates as important. And here he is fasting on Yom Kippur. But I just wanted everyone to know, anybody who says that Rosh Hashanah isn't valid anymore, that's dumb. Okay, do you see that? So we have to understand there is more than one calendar. Nisan is the first month of the religious calendar. Tishri is the first month of the civil calendar, and they operate at the same time. Okay, with that said, here we go. Let's do a little review. Here we are. We're talking about the meanings, knowing the times and the seasons. We started with the east. We have Judah, and then Issachar, and then Zebulun. And what do you remember about spring? 2 Samuel 11, 1. Spring is the time when kings go out to war. And that first tribe, Judah, which is the month of Nisan, is the month when they figured the year of how long a king reigned. Okay, so if you want to know how long a king reigned, if he started two months before Nisan, he'd already been served a year after two months. Because they always would take place, that was the time when they would. Now, we also know that war is spring. This is the time. So all three of these tribes, all three of these months refer to war. So Nisan, who did they battle in Nisan? Who was the big battle with in Nisan? It's called Egypt when they crossed the Red Sea. Okay. That, that happened in Nisan. That's why Passover is Passover. They, were, they crossed over from Egypt. Okay, how about uh, Issachar? Who did Issachar fight? Well, I have what the month of Nisan means. It's a means of war, but God is the one who's doing all the fighting. Okay, it's redemptions. It's miracles. But did they have to do anything uh, to beat Egypt? God caused all the plagues. God crossed the Red Sea. All they had to do was pack their bags. Okay, so Nisan is the month where God fights for you. You're redeemed. And miracles. Okay, so what's the, Issachar is the second month. And what's the name of the second month? What's the second month? Come on. Eor, remember Eor? Eor. Okay, and who does Israel fight that month? Who's the big fight with? What happened the second month after they left Egypt? Amalek. Okay. So here, but with Amalek, they had to fight as well. And Moses' hands were held up and Joshua was fighting. So the first month, God is kind. 
He does all the fighting for us. And then the next month, he says, here comes fighting, but this time I want you involved. Okay, what can you guys, I want you to be part of the fight. All right? And this is where we have discernment and testing. If you remember, it was the sons of Issachar who knew the times and seasons of what Israel ought to do. All right? So it's a time of testing. This is when they were tested with famine and they wanted bread. They were tempted with water and they wanted water rather than depending on God, who just got done helping them the whole month of Nisan, rather than turning to God and saying, God, you, we're fighting. Can you help us? They rejected God. And they thought God brought them out to kill them. Okay, so what is the third month now? What happens in the third month? What's the name of the third month? Third month. Savan. That's Pentecost. That's when they gave the Torah. So what happens? God says, okay, now that you've fought some on your own, you need to be properly equipped for both spiritual battles and physical battles. The first month Nisan was basically a spiritual battle. God is conquering Egypt. Okay, and the next month, God invites his kids to see what it's like to go to war and try. And they had to realize, are they going to trust in God? They're testing. Are they going to trust in the God that just redeemed you or not? Which so now in the third month, God gives them weapons. The greatest weapon there is his word. And that works on both a physical level and a spiritual level. Does that make sense? They'll kind of understand when you think of the East, what do you think of? War. War. War, it's going to be with the natural Egypt. It's going to be with the supernatural spirit, Amalek. That's in every generation. And then we have to realize, wow, if we're going to fight these battles, we better have God's word. And so he gives us his word so we can fight both the physical battles and the spiritual battles. And so it's in the spring war. So I hope this kind of helps you remember the tribes, the order and the months so by the time we're done, I'm hoping anyone can tell me the 12 tribes, where they were around the tabernacle, what month they all stand for. And you guys are going to, you can do it. I believe it. Okay, now we also realize in the middle of this war is when this harvest is. The spring harvest, Passover also, which is the barley harvest. Then the wheat harvest, which is Shavuot. And so guess what that means? The harvest always comes to end the bad times. No one gets saved in the good times. They could care less about God. They don't need God. The harvest always comes when there is war. Why do you think God is bringing war? Because he wants people to repent. This is why I wrote my book, America at War, 24 through 26, because that's what we're going to be seeing. But we know the times and the seasons, and so now we're not worried. The question is, are we going to be afraid like the 10 spies were, or are we going to be positive like Joshua Caleb? So this is why when we understand the times and seasons we go through things, we go, I always go to the calendar. What month is this? What day is this? And I look at historical events when they happened, which is why you need to get the calendar that El Shaddai produces. Okay, so now we move to the south. Okay, so the last two weeks, I've talked about the southern tribes. And the fourth tribe to go is Reuben, which is the month of Tammuz, all right? And then we went to Simeon, which is the month of Av. And today, we're going to look at Gad, which is the sixth month, month of Elul. So, let's review. Reuben is what month? It's right there. Okay, good. Tammuz. Reuben is Tammuz. And what is it all about? It's about sight. Okay, so he's getting an eye exam up in the top corner there. He's looking, he goes to the eye doctor. And so when you think of Tammuz, you have to think of the eye doctor. It's a month of examining our vision, our perception. You know, here's the thing. I was just with my family for like five days uh, visiting my brothers and sisters that lived in Wichita, Kansas. And I might remember something as a kid, but I'm the second youngest. So I might remember something as a four-year-old, but my other older sister is 14 years old. And she can say, well, you don't have it exactly right. It really was like this. 
Okay. And so it, all of us have our own perspective. And so we have to learn that we might need to expand our perspective. And so the month of Tammuz is an examination of our faith. Are we doing what is right in our own eyes or are we doing what is right in God's eyes? Okay, a lot of times when we look at the Moses tabernacle or we look at the temple, we start with, you know, you got to come through the door. Okay, you have your sacrifices and then you have the labor and then you move into the holy place and then the holy of holies. But we need to look at it from God's perspective sometimes. Sometimes we need to start in the Holy of Holies and look at what God sees to the holy place, to the labor, to the sacrifice coming in. Because all too often, we only look at our own perspective. This is why we have to love our spouse's perspectives. We have to love our kids' perspectives. Because sometimes kids will tell us things from their perspective. If we don't believe them because we have our own perspective, that's not good. We need to find out why they are seeing what they are seeing. Okay, so what is the next tribe after Reuben? We talked about last week, Simeon, which is the month of Av. Now, if you'll notice, Simeon, these first three letters, what does that spell? You have the Shin, the Mem, and the Ayin. That's Simeon's name. And what does that spell? Shema. Okay. And it has to do with what? What does Shema mean? Hear and obey. Okay. So the last month. Okay, we've been going through these wars in spring. Now we're in summer, and we need to recheck our vision. Are we looking at things from God's perspective or ours? And then we need to recheck our hearing. Are we hearing from God, or are we listening to man? Doesn't this all make sense? You know, when you follow it, you understand the times and seasons, and you know where you're at. Well, I go like, oh, my goodness, we're in the month of Av. I better hear from God, because God's speaking but I got to get away from all the noise pollution, all right? And if we remember the month of Av, it goes from bad to worse, and then we have a little bit of joy the second half. So Av, which means father, it starts out with spankings, okay? Because of we haven't been looking or watching, we haven't been listening, and so there's the spanking, and the temple is destroyed on what day? Ninth of Av, but then... A week later, on the 15th of Av, is love, forgiveness, kindness. And so we have to see that the month of Av is a month of examining our hearing. Are we hearing and obeying? Are we causing, or there's a bunch of disunity and discord the first half. And then the second half, we realized we're, we're being disciplined and we find forgiveness and unity and everyone comes together. So Av is uh, like evening and morning. Starts in the evening, bad, disunity. We're not listening. We're not obeying. And then from the spanking, it leads us into the second half of the same month, which is day, where now we're being disciplined by God, and now we have forgiveness and we have unity. Because remember, who died on the first of Av? There's only one person in the whole Bible that gives the date of their death. Aaron, the high priest, died on the first of Av, and Aaron was known for bringing unity. He dies, and you see all kinds of disunity happen immediately, okay? And then, do you remember on the 15th of Av what the occasion was? They had the 11 tribes almost completely wiped out the tribe of Reuben. Because Reuben had done something that was horrible. And they had made a vow no one would give their daughters to the men of the tribe of Reuben. And so they didn't want to break their vow. And so they said, okay, we can't give them, but we'll let them take them. And so they, the girls would all be dancing on the 15th of Av up in Shiloh. And then the tribe of Reuben would go find a wife. So that's what was going on. Okay, so that brings us to... Gad and the tribe of Elul. And so we're going to finish the south, and I will give you the meaning of all the south combined. But let's take a trip through who was Gad and what does the month of Elul mean? Well, let's start with 
his birth, Gad. In Genesis 30, verse 11, Leah says, good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. So what does Gad mean? Good fortune. All right. In other words, a lot of times, uh, if you look at Proverbs 18, 22, whoever finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. What do they always say at the end of a wedding? Mazel tov! <laughs> and mazel tov means good fortune. Okay, so a low means a great month. It's a, it's a time of great fortune, of goodness. And let's take a look at this. The word mazel, as in mazel tov, which means fortune, uh, tov is good, the mazel is fortune. Well, it so happens that uh, mazel in Hebrew also means a constellation. And this is why the 12 tribes are each associated with a constellation, uh, the maserat. And mazel, the maserat, that is God created the sun, the moon, and the stars for what? Hello. So the signs also. And what happens, whatever God does, the devil perverts it. So the devil comes up with astrology. Well, that doesn't mean biblical astronomy is bad because he perverted it. He wants to pervert everything. And here's how you can tell the big difference between biblical astronomy and astrology. Astrology is all about you. Biblical astronomy is all about him. So if you keep him at the forefront and not you, you're going to be fine. There's a book by a Bollinger called Witness of the Stars. He lived in the 1800s, and it's incredible. You can get it free online. I, might, I think there's even a link on our website. But you can read which tribe is assigned to which constellation, and it all has to do with the gospel story from creation to his return. It's all there. Witness of the Stars by Bollinger. You can read it for free online. Just put down online version, Witness of the Stars by Bollinger. It's 200 years old, and it's incredible. And it also, he also wrote a book called Numbers in Scripture, and it tells you what the scriptural meaning of numbers are, which is also absolutely incredible. Okay, so let's look at Deuteronomy uh, 33. And we're going to look at verse 20 and 21. Oh, and in case you're wondering, the constellation here, look at this. Anyone know what that constellation is? That's Virgo, the bride. Okay, now listen to Deuteronomy 33, 20 and 21. Of Gad, he said... <clears throat> Now, this is Moses, not Jacob. Moses is blessing the tribes. And look what it says concerning Gad. A blessing be on him who makes wide the limits of Gad. Okay. He takes his rest like a she-lion, taking for himself the arm and the crown of the head. He kept for himself the first part, for his was the ruler's right. Look what Gad did. He put in force the righteousness of the Lord and his decisions for Israel. That's not Gad's decisions. That's God's decision. So Gad put in force God's righteousness and made sure God's decisions is what Israel would go by. Now, that's pretty good. Okay, because he was from one of the concubines. He wasn't from Rachel or Leah. And now here is Jacob on his deathbed blessing Gad. In Genesis 49, 19, look at this. Gad, an army is going to come against them, but he's going to come down on them in their flight. So here an army is going to come against them. Gad's going to go after them. They're going to be fleeing, and he just comes down on them and crushes them. So Gad, wow, this is amazing. Now, I don't remember if I have this in your notes. I think I do. I hope. Uh, there are a few verses I added uh, that I didn't send. Is Song of Songs in your notes? Okay, well, write down Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 13. When you think of the month of Elul, what do you think of? What's the month known for? The month of Elul. It's 
as the month of return, like the prodigal son returned home. And so uh, it's also repentance. So the month of a lull, after we've had the two bad months of summer, no, not seeing, not listening, we now realize we need to go home. So a lull is the month of the prodigal, where we decide we need to repent, we need to return. And here, I was just reading about Genesis 49, 19, which speaks of, again, returning, repenting. And here we see an army, and this is the month of a lull. There's going to be an army coming down upon the enemy. Well, listen to Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 13. The daughters of Jerusalem see the bride, and they say, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. What will you see in the Shulamite? Ah, the company of two armies. So you've got the spiritual army and the physical army coming down on Satan because Elul is the month before Tishri when Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Tabernacles. We've got to get the bride, the foolish virgins, have to get ready by what? Midnight because then the new year starts. Well, guess what? Elul is the month of the bride trying to get ready. So she's ready at midnight or the time when the next month turns. Listen to this. The month of Elul speaks of the end, okay, because it's the last month of the civil calendar, just like December is the month of the end of our calendar. And it means going into the last harvest. And I, what I mean by that, did you know, creation began in the month of Elul. How do we know? Because Tishri is when Adam was created, which is the sixth day. So the Five days, first five days of creation were the last five days of the law. Make sense? All right. So creation begins in this month. That's why the month of Elul, which goes to Gad, I think it's amazing that all of creation began in the month of Gad, one of the concubines. Okay. And <clears throat> let's uh, look at this. I don't know if you realized what happened on the first day of a lull? Well, on the first of a lull was the very day Moses ascended the mount to make atonement for Israel. And he was how many days up there? 40 days. Okay. And what did he do? He Fasted, had no bread, no water. Now let's look here a minute. Here we are at creation. <clears throat> this is this year's calendar. <clears throat> but creation, the first day was actually on the 25th of Elul. That was the first, every year, 25th of Elul is the first day of creation. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And here is Tishri. The first of Tishri is when Adam and Eve were created. Okay, man was created on the sixth day which is the first of Tishri. So I'm just kind of showing you, uh, and here I have this just because it was on the fourth day, God created the sun and the moon and the stars for signs. So that's, I just wanted to show you that. But here, here's what I want you to realize. On the first day of Elul is when Moses ascended the mount, he comes down on Yom Kippur 40 days later. It's the same time Yeshua was immersed by John on the first of Elul. And he was there for 40 days fasting bread and water. And he comes down on Yom Kippur. Uh, look at Exodus 34, 28. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days, 40 nights. He did not eat bread. He did not drink water. And he wrote on the tables the words of the covenant, the 10 words. Then look at Exodus 34. Let's go back a minute, verse 6 and 7. The Lord went past before Moses' eyes, and he's saying his name. He's declaring his 13 attributes. The Lord, the Lord, a God full of pity and grace. He's slow to wrath. He's great in mercy and faith, having mercy on thousands 
overlooking evil and wrongdoing and sin. He will not let the wrongdoers go free, but will send punishment on children for the sins of their fathers and on their children's children to the third and fourth generation. But you have to realize God is proclaiming his name as merciful, 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 full of mercy, full of loving kindness. All right. And that happened in the month of Elul. And then we see at Matthew 4, 1 and 2, Jesus will let up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, guess what? It happened at the very same time frame that Moses was up on the mount for 40 days and 40 nights, the first of Elul to Yom Kippur. But wait, there's more. Jonah, uh, he spoke Look at this, Jonah chapter three, verse four and six. Jonah began to enter into the cities. It's a day journey across, it's so big. And he cries out and says, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and they proclaimed a fast. And they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least. For word came to the king of Nineveh and he rose from his throne. He laid his robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth and in ashes. Okay, so the very same time Moses went up, the very same time Yeshua went out, is the very same time from the first of Elul to Yom Kippur. It's this, what is this telling you? The month of Elul is the time to be fasting and praying, and it's the bride getting ready for the wedding, which takes place on Rosh Hashanah. I hope you guys can see these connections here. Now, I want to show you something that is quite amazing. If you remember here, Jonah is proclaiming in 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. So the king calls a fast and everyone fasts for 40 days. <clears throat> this is a, everyone in history agrees. This isn't me speculating. This is all, oh, you can look it up online. There was a famous eclipse. Uh, uh, let me see where I'm at. It's called the Bursagale Eclipse. It was a total solar eclipse that happened on June 15th in the year 762, 763. And it happened right at sun. You can only have a solar eclipse during the day. You can only have a lunar eclipse at night. But this happened during the day, but just as the sun was setting. And it happened on the 1st of Tammuz. In Nineveh. So the Ninevites saw this great total solar eclipse two months before Jonah arrived, which is why they were ripe. And it so happens, it's 720 miles away. So when Jonah got spit back up on the shore from the whale, he had a 40 day walk. That's walking about 18 miles a day, 15, 18 miles a day, which can be done. You know, but what's fascinating is Tammuz 1 is when God appeared to Jonah and Jonah took off for a couple of weeks trying to run away. And when he comes back, you take 40 days walk and you arrive on the first of Elul. Isn't this fascinating? Okay, now, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. So here's the thing. Elul in Hebrew basically means harvest. So now the spring is the harvest. A lull, the end of a lull, they're getting ready for the harvest in Tishri, which is the grape harvest. That's what they would harvest. This is why. Look at Mark 4.29. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest is come. Okay. Guess who was from the tribe of Gad? Gad? True. Who else was from uh, Gad Jr.? No. I will tell you. Who is supposed to come before Tishri 1? Elijah. Elijah was from the tribe of Gad, which is why he's the one to come as one of the two witnesses to warn the people of what is going to be coming in 
Tishri. Look at Revelation verse 14, 15 and 18. It says, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. And he says, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come to reap. The harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle, the earth was reaped. Another angel comes out also having a sharp sickle. And another angel comes out from the altar with that power of a fire and cried a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle. Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather what? The clusters of the vine for her grapes are fully ripe. And guess what? Tishri is the month of the grape harvest. Barley is Passover, wheat is Pentecost, and grapes. And guess what? It's going to happen in Tishri. All these events are going to happen. Um, what's interesting, in Aramaic, the word alul means to search. Search. That's what we're supposed to be doing, searching. In Akkadian language, it means repentance and intercession. So alul is all about seeking God, repenting, interceding, as a matter of fact, look at uh, Jeremiah 31, 20 and 21. Is Ephraim my dear son? Isn't he a darling child? For as often as I spoke against him, I still earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. And look what God says. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord God. Then he says, set up the road signs, make the guideposts, set your heart toward the highway, even the way by which you went. Turn again, virgin of Israel, turn again to these your cities. And so what do we see? It's turning, returning, returning. He's asking his body to return to him as their dad. And we know, and here I have this picture, this is uh, getting ready for the wedding. And the harvest is of the grapes. It's always about relationship. These two verses are not on your notes. You can write them in. I'm going to have them on the screen. Look at Song of Songs, which is about the bride. Verse 10 and 12, she says, I am my beloved's. His desire is toward me. Come, my beloved, let us go where? Into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. If you remember in the teaching of the Song of Songs, she didn't want to work the harvest. But finally she matures and she wants to get up early. Okay, she wants to work the harvest. And the lull is all about working the harvest. And then look at this verse, Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice. Give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has done what? Made herself ready. This is why it's known as the king is in the field. This is the month the king is in the field because he wants to have the personal relationship. He wants to see where the tares are, where the wheat are before they get taken out. Okay, as a matter of fact, uh, let me show you this. Here's the word Elul, okay? Now, I don't know if anybody, can anybody read this? I will, I will help you here. Then you tell me what it means. Ani ladodi vadodi li. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. This is the song of songs. Well, watch this. The first four letters spell Elul. This is the month of Elul. And if you look at the last four letters, it's you, 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 you. What numerical value is you? 10, 10 times four is 40. It's the 40 days from Elul 1 to Yom Kippur. Okay, only God can do things like this. Here is the stone for Gad. It is an agate. Now, this is the word for agate, shavo. You can see the shin, bait, bob. Well, guess what? The word repent is shavu, right, right. The words come together. The whole stone tells you a lull is the month for repentance, even assigned to the tribe. Now, look at this. This here is, um, if you look at uh, Exodus 39, 12, it was an agate, and in Hebrew, it's shavu. And what's amazing, it was in that lull that God proclaimed the 13 attributes of mercy, which tells us the month of a lull is full of forgiveness for us. Okay, now look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. It says the Lord your God is going to do what? Circumcise your heart. See, circumcision of the heart is in the Torah. Why do you want to throw out the Torah? And the heart of your seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Here is the Hebrew word. You can see lavav, your heart. Well, guess what? When does that happen? There's a lull again. This is when God circumcises the hearts. 
It's in the law. All right. Now, let's look at Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. Here they're rebuilding the temple and the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of the law. Wow. What happened on the 25th day of the month of the law? God said, let there be light. The very first day of creation is the day the walls were built. God loves borders. God loves walls. And then uh, it says, oh, this is, it came to pass when all of our enemies heard it, that all the nations that were about us, they were afraid and were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived this work was wrought of God. Okay, now look at Ezekiel 8, 1 through 3. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, which month is the sixth month? The sixth month is Elul. Okay, and it happened on the fifth day of the month. What happens, Ezekiel was in his house, and the responsible men of Judah were also seated before me. The hand of the Lord came on me there. Looking up, I saw uh, the form like a fire from the middle of his body, and down there was fire up from the middle of his body is sort of shining like electrum. And he put out the form of a hand and took me by the hair of my head in the wind. And he lifted Ezekiel up between heaven and earth by the hair. Can you imagine someone just, I'd like to see God try to do that to me. <laughs> but he picked up Ezekiel by the hair and he hangs him over Jerusalem. He's hanging by the hair of his head halfway up. And it says, he lifted me between the earth and heaven and took me into the visions of God in Jerusalem to the way to the inner door facing the north, where was the seat of the image of envy. Okay, so Elul is also a month of visions. If we got our eyes fixed, look at Haggai chapter 1, 1 through 5. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month. What's the sixth month? Hello. And look at this. It's on what day? The first day, the new moon. Almost everything happens on the first day of a month. And that came the word of the Lord Haggai to the prophet Zerubbabel. And it says, these are the words of the Lord of armies. These people are saying the time has not come for building the Lord's house. And then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, is it a time for you to be living in roofed houses while this house lies waste? For this cause, the Lord of armies has said, give thought to your ways. All right. Wow. This is huge. Here are his people who don't know what time it is who don't know what season it is. They're thinking it's not time to build the Lord's house, but it was time. This is why we have to be like the sons of Issachar, discerning the times. Okay, Haggai 1, 13 and 15, it goes on. Then Haggai, whom the Lord has sent to give these words to the people, said, I'm with you, says the Lord. And the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, ruler of Judah, was moved by the Lord, as was the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the rest of the people. They came and they did the work in the house of the Lord of armies, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month. That's the day before creation. Okay, here. Uh, and so it's so fun when you realize these things are happening in this month. This is how you know what each month is about. Matter of fact, in Daniel 3, 16 and 17, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fiery furnace in Elul. Okay. Um, uh, here's the other thing. Take a look at this picture. God, the month of Elul, I don't know if you knew this, beginning 30 days before Tishri, they blow the shofar every day. Every day they're blowing the shofar to get ready for the 100 blasts on Rosh Hashanah. Well, the purpose of the blast is to wake up. And just as the alarm clock wakes the body, the shofar wakes the soul. All right. So a lull is the month of warning that harvest is coming. You better get ready. Just like the prodigal son, he returned. Now, um, here's the thing. And this is what is said by the sages that before God even created the world, he created repentance, okay? Because he knew man was going to need it. To say that repentance is a pre-existing condition before creating the world means that forgiveness was already built into the fabric of the relationship, okay? The fact that repentance or returning pre-exists the relationship means that because we love each other, forgiveness and wanting to repair damages even before they happen are built into a relationship. And God says, oh, look, I know you're not perfect. So we have to understand that concept. Well, here, look at Romans 13, 11, and 12. 
Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of your sleep. This is speaking about the month of Elul. Okay. Now is our salvation nearer than we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. All of our sages stated that all your deeds should be done for the sake of heaven. Likewise, it is written, know him in all your ways. Okay. The problem is those who do the works to glorify themselves, they're no good. If you're doing the good works to glorify him, it's good. Which is why Proverbs 3, 6 says, in all your ways, listen to him and he will make straight your footsteps. And so um, most of our time is spent dealing with our material needs and earning the means by which to provide for them because God said six days you're going to work. Okay, so that means we have to work. And the seventh day we rest. Well, why didn't God set it up so we only worked one day a week? And we had six days with him. Wouldn't that make more sense? Well, God didn't think so. Um, God designed a world in which man is forced to involve himself primarily in the material rather than in the spiritual activities. The reason for this reflects the purpose of creation. God created the world so that he could have a dwelling place in the lower worlds. So our service of God has to center on the ordinary details of existence for the purpose of infusing them with godliness and not only on the purely spiritual level. The king's presence in the field represents the ultimate purpose of creation. So our efforts must be directed to bringing godliness into our material world. God's presence must be found not only in the royal palace, but even in the earth, it must be transformed into a dwelling place for him. So God's will is that his presence be revealed where? In the field. So we have to recognize our world as his dwelling place. We are his dwelling place. He wants to dwell in this field. And so we need to be working for him and not for ourselves. So once a month, a year, one month a year, the king leaves his royal palace to go out and meet the common folks. Well, Yeshua left his habitation and came down to earth to meet with his creation. In uh, 1 Chronicles 21, 28, it says, at that time, when David saw the Lord had answered him in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses made in the wilderness and the altar of the burnt offering were at that season in the high place of Gibeon. Remember, the Moses tabernacle was at Gibeon. Well, look at Jeremiah 28, 1. It came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah in the fourth year in the fifth month, that's of, that there was a prophet named Hananiah, which was of where? Gibeon. That means he was not only a prophet, he was a priest working around the tabernacle. And he spoke unto me uh, in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and of all the people. And I don't know if you knew this, what tribe was Jeremiah from? Jeremiah was a priest. He's from the tribe of Levi. Okay. And Hananiah is a priest. So these guys are cousins. They're both from Levi. They're both priests. And look what it says in Jeremiah 28, 15 through 17. Then said the prophet Jeremiah to Hananiah, the prophet, listen here, Hananiah, the Lord did not send you, but you're making this people to trust in a lie. Therefore says the Lord, behold, I will cast you from off the face of the earth. This year you will die because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah, the prophet died the same year in the what month? Okay. Now, wait a minute. When does the year begin? Tishri 1. Okay, but this is in the fifth month, and he says you're going to die this year, but he dies in the seventh month. Wait a minute, that's the next year. So what happened? They say he literally died at Erev Rosh Hashanah. He died that year, but he also died in the month of Tishri 1. It was right at sunset on the last day of Elul that he died. Uh, and listen to Acts 26, 20. What does Peter say? Everyone should repent and return to God doing works worthy of what? Repentance. We need to do works, but our works have to be worthy of repentance, true repentance. Ephesians 5, 14 is in on your notes. 
Wherefore, he says, awake you who are sleeping, arise from the dead and Christ will shine upon you. All right, so we need to awake. So here we go. Gad is a month to awake. We need to actively be returning. We need to do works of repentance. It's the preparation of the bride to be ready and we need to be working the harvest. So the month of Elul is all about works, working the harvest, actively returning to the field. It's the bride getting ready and working the harvest. So here we go. We just got done doing the East and we went through uh, what all of those were about. Okay, and now we go to the South. Here's what the South is. We saw Reuben is the month of Tammuz, which has to do with vision. Simeon is Ob, which has to do with hearing. Gad is at Lul, which has to do with restoration. And all of the summer is about examining ourselves. Listen to 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves within the faith. Prove your own selves. So the summer is the time of examination. Examine your vision. Examine your hearing. Examine your works. Doesn't that make sense? It's amazing how it all goes together when you study this. So let's stand because I am like way over. <laughs>